How many of you guys have applied to colleges recently? Okay. How many of you guys eventually are going to in like the next couple months or like it's something that's on your, so like a lot of people here, right? When you're applying to colleges, some of you, as, or some of you already have been accepted into a university based on the merits of the grades that you got or the extracurricular stuff that you did um, or the stuff that's basically on your academic resume. Some of you, when you apply to certain schools, will be rejected on that basis. You'll look at your grades and the stuff that you did or didn't do, and you won't make it into maybe a certain school. So we all have those things that we need to get maybe into the school that we want to get into. Uh, but those aren't the only criteria that actually help us to get into school. There are actually some colleges or universities where a school will accept you based on who you know or to someone who you're related to. Especially when it comes to like maybe some of these like Ivy League colleges. If you're like the fifth generation of your family to have gone to Harvard or something, there's something in your name, who you are, and who you know in your family that actually makes you acceptable to that university to some degree. When that school sees your last name, you're accepted because of the family that you belong to and the people that you know. There's something of a picture in that of what it means to approach God in prayer. And when, when we consider what kind of prayers are acceptable to God, what are the prayers that he hears, that he's pleased by, that he accepts? And what I want us to really come to understand more than anything else tonight is that our prayers being accepted and heard and being pleasing to God are all based on who we know. And it makes our prayers acceptable to him. And our prayers are acceptable and pleasing to God when we come to him in the name of his son. That's the big idea for tonight. Is that we, so we let, maybe you're picking up on this theme that this first week we talked about God as our father. This week we're going to discuss who God is in, in his son, Jesus, God the son. And then next week we're going to talk about the role that God the Holy Spirit has in our prayers as we consider this tonight, that our prayers are accepted by God the Father based on knowing his Son, it's going to be really important for us to understand that the only way that our prayers are accepted is through Jesus. So in the way that we can think about college applications or whatever uh, you try and do to get into college, like some of you will be able to do enough to be accepted, that you'll have an impressive enough resume to be accepted. There's no spiritual resume that is acceptable enough or impressive enough for God to actually accept you on the basis of your merits, on what you do, on how much you obey, on how good of a person you think you are. The only way that our prayers are made acceptable to God is through his son. And we're going to consider how um, significant and exclusive that is to understand that it's only through Jesus, only in his name that we can actually pray to God the Father and know that our prayers are pleasing to him. But we're also going to see the wonderful, beautiful good news that that brings with it. That if we're united to Jesus, what that does for our relationship with God the Father. So we're considering this theme, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This is one of the fundamental things as Christians who believe in what the Bible says about us, about God, about the world that we live in. We believe that God is three in one. So there's one God in three persons. It's one of those things that's really hard to wrap our minds around. Um, but at its core, it's fundamental to understanding who we are and actually how we, at a very just base level, relate to God and how we can actually be made right with him. We have to understand who God the Father is, God the Son is, and who God the Holy Spirit is. It's not an abstract idea, but it's a vital and really important part of understanding what it means to be a Christian. How many of you guys like math? Okay, a smattering of people. 
You guys, literally one of the only things I remember from high school came to my mind this week as I studied to teach this. And so I have to talk about it because I never talk about math because I'm horrible at it. Do any of you guys know what the transitive property is? I'm sure like probably all of you at this point. I know this isn't like high level math, but here's the deal. So if you don't remember the transitive property, this has something to do with tonight. Trust me, just stick with me. So if A equals B and B equals C, then what? A equals C, right? I think I remember it because it's like just about as simple of math as you can possibly come up with, okay? If A equals B and B equals C, then that means A has to equal C. I want to use this to help us wrap our minds around how important it is to understand what it means to pray in Jesus' name and what it does to how we relate to God the Father. I've got the transitive property of prayer for you, okay? Here we go. It's like the lamest, corniest thing I've done all year. Deal with it. Okay. The Father loves the Son. And we're going to dive deep into this. These are our three points for tonight. So the Father loves the Son. That's A. If I'm a Christian, I'm united to Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, the Father loves me in Jesus. Okay? So if the Father, we think about the relationship of God the Father and God the Son, a perfect relationship of love. And then by faith, I'm united to God the Son, Jesus, in this love relationship with Jesus. And therefore, as one who is in Jesus and connected and united to Jesus, all that God the Father has in this relationship with God the Son is mine in Jesus. Therefore, I relate to the Father in the same way that Jesus relates to the Father. This is one of the most significant and beautiful doctrines and things we can understand that the Bible teaches us of all the things you'll ever come to understand. And so we're going to dive into it tonight. We're going to see specifically how it relates to how we pray. We're going to talk about these three relationships. First, we're going to talk about the Son and the Father, how they relate to each other. And then we're going to talk about you, if you're a Christian, which I don't know if everybody in this room is. I bet not everybody is. But if you're a Christian, how you relate to the Son. And if you're not a Christian, how tonight you could relate to Jesus if you turn to him in faith. And then thirdly, because of that relationship that you have with Jesus, how you can have a relationship with God the Father through his Son. Okay? Transitive property of prayer. Here we go. The Son and the Father. What we see here and elsewhere in the Bible, these verses we're going to consider tonight, is that there is this relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and the God who is three in one. There is an eternal, perfect, intimate, and infinite relationship of love that exists in what uh, is often referred to as the Godhead, the three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You see, God, one of the fundamental things that the Bible teaches us about him is that he is a relational God at the very heart of who he is. There's a, portion, there's a section in Mark 1, verses 9 through 11, that I think really beautifully paints this picture of all three persons in one God, of something happening here in the beginning of Mark. So it says this, as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he so this is Jesus' baptism at the very beginning of his ministry. He saw heaven being torn open and the spirit, so there's the third person of the Trinity, descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, this is God the Father, saying, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is one of the fundamental places that we look in the Bible and we come to understand that God is not this like shape-shifting God that is at one moment a father and then he turns into a man and then becomes a son and then at times he's like this impersonal force that floats around like Ghostbusters or something. God is three distinct persons who is still one God. Hard to wrap our mind around, but so crucial in understanding who God is. God is infinite, unbroken, perfect relationship of love that has existed for all of eternity. 
That's what we see here in this relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. And then specifically, this relationship that exists between the Father and the Son, we see that the Father says, You are my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So here we see that there is a perfect relationship of love between the Father and the Son. That's really hard for us to even begin to imagine because some of you guys, you go, like I, you know, we talked about last week, like some of us have dads who haven't been there for us, some of us who have, just have broken dysfunction. Actually, most of us have dysfunction in our families to some degree. And actually, none of our relationships in this life or in this world are perfect relationships of love. Even the best relationships that you've got with the best people in your life are just a glimmer, just a small fraction of a picture of what a true love, self-giving love relationship should actually look like. And what we see in the Bible between God the Father and God the Son is the very standard for what love between two persons should look like. It is a relationship that is defined by there is, there's never miscommunication. Each person is entirely consumed by love for the other and not for themselves. There's no selfishness. There's no pride. There's no deceit. There's no unfaithfulness, no jealousy. There's an author who describes that this, this interpersonal relationship of love that exists within God is like a perfect, harmonious dance that has existed for all of eternity. And we see here in this passage that, that that relationship between father and son is perfect. And they perfectly love each other. It's a relationship of love. Now that relationship between son and father is so crucial for us to understand as we move to our second point. As we think about, if you're a Christian, how do I relate to God the son? There's a well-known pastor. He used to... He used to ask his people in his church uh, a question to kind of diagnose or get like a good sense of um, like where they were at. Like if, if they were a Christian, you know, what was kind of going on in their heart. And this pastor, he would ask them, are you a Christian? It's a very simple question. But he would gauge their response by if the person would respond and say, you say, if you, are you a Christian? He would say, well, I'm trying to be. If that was the response, this pastor would know that this person has kind of completely missed the idea of what it actually means to be a Christian. Let me explain that for a moment. Because to be a Christian is actually to have a certain status and to be united to Jesus. And it's not so much about what we try to do or what we're doing on a daily basis to maybe try and make ourselves better for God, to try and be better people, to try and look better for other people. But it's more about a certain status and who we know and who we're connected to in Jesus. The Bible talks about in so many places this relationship primarily that we have as Christians as being united to Jesus. And actually, the term Christian that we use all the time, the Apostle Paul, who writes most of the New Testament, most often when he's referring to people who are Christians, he refers to them as being those who are in Christ. So those who are actually wrapped up in Jesus and united to him. It's a status. It's like if you were to ask me, like, are you married? Well, I'm, I'm trying to be. Yeah, I'm an answer is that. I'm either married or I'm not. Or I ask, uh, Paul, are you a Kalo? You go, well, I'm trying to be. You either are or you're not. You're either a, you have the status of being a member in your family or you don't. And that's what it is to be a Christian. And that's so important for us to understand. Because if you being a Christian depends on every day just trying to be better and trying on your own willpower to be just a moral person, any of us could probably last like probably 20 minutes before we understand like I'm screwing this thing up and I am not a moral person and the thoughts that I think and the things that I do and the way that I act fall so short of the standard that the Bible gives me for what a Christian should look like. But if me being a Christian is who I know and who I'm united to in the Son of God, then that absolutely changes everything. 
because it's a status that doesn't change. It's a status that irrespective of my failures and my behavior, not that behavior and morality and things don't matter, but it doesn't change my standing before God and it doesn't change my relationship with Jesus. Just in the same way that me, the way that I treat Emily, isn't constantly moving me from being married or unmarried from her, but we're committed to each other. We're united to each other in this static relationship of love and commitment and a covenant. And that's what it is to be a Christian. It's to be united to Jesus. It's a status. Jesus describes to be a Christian as this permanent connection and union with Jesus. In John 15, he talks about, he gives this really simple picture of being a branch that's attached to a vine is what it means to be united to Jesus. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. I love how simple Jesus is when he explains some of these complex things. He just says, I'm like a vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, it's that mutually exclusive thing where he goes, you're either connected to me or you're not. You bear much fruit if you're connected to the vine. But if you're not, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. See, you guys, there aren't good Christians and okay Christians and bad Christians and then, like, pretty good non-Christians and then, like, okay non-Christians and, like, horrible evil people. You are either one of two types of people. As you sit out here tonight, you are either in Christ or you are outside of Christ. You've either trusted in him and you're connected and united to him and you're on the vine, you're a branch connected to the vine, or you're a branch that's disconnected, and apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. I'm not afraid to tell that to you guys tonight because it's the most important question in the world that you could ever ask yourself is to say, am I in Jesus or am I outside of Jesus? Because apart from him, you can do nothing. But in Christ, you bear fruit and you experience life and life as it's meant to be lived. And eventually we'll get to what that means for the way that we pray. So which one are you? Are you a Christian? And when I ask you that question, what's your answer? Do you say, I'm trying to be? You've missed the point. If that's the first thing that you think, you're either inside of Christ or outside of Christ. So here's our transitive property. Eternal, infinite, unbroken relationship of love between God the Father and God the Son. For a Christian, you're a branch connected to the vine, united to the Son, union, static relationship with Jesus. It doesn't change. If that is the case, the Father, we see, is infinitely pleased with his beloved Son, Jesus. I am eternally united and connected to that very same Jesus. Therefore, the Father is infinitely pleased with me and loves me. And all that belongs to Jesus, everything that he has with the Father, because I am united to him, all of those privileges, all of those benefits, all of that everlasting and unfathomable love that's built up in this love relationship that has existed for eternity, you guys, if you're united to Jesus, that is yours. It is freely available to you and freely available to me if I'm in Christ. This is amazing news. This is incredible. We see Jesus describing in John 17 how the Father's love flows directly through Jesus into those who are united to Jesus. John 17 is one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. And eventually later in the year, we're actually going to dive into this section of the Bible. But this is Jesus in John 17. We get this inside look. Jesus praying to the Father. And he's praying for his disciples, his followers. So we get this inside look to the heart of Jesus. How Jesus prays for you and for me if we're followers of Jesus. We actually hear the actual words that God the Son speaks to God the Father. He says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these, that, and these know that you have sent me. 
I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's that transitive property working out. The love that the Father has for the Son then becomes ours in faith in the Son as Jesus abides in us and we abide in him. A while back, I had a, a friend who worked at the, used to be called the Q, now it's called the Rocket Mortgage Super Field House, whatever it is. Um, and this friend, like once a year, a group of me and a couple of my buddies, he would invite us to actually come and visit the Q, the, like the Cavs Arena, and come play pickup basketball on the court. And it was like just an amazing thing. I never would have been able to do it otherwise. We showed up like early in the morning, and this guy that works there, he's got his key card. He gets us into the building, and he takes us, and we, basically I'm just like sticking with this guy and following him throughout the building, walking through, and he's, he's going through all these doors, and there's security guards everywhere. And the guy basically just is like, stick with me. I'm going to get you to like the, the belly of this thing, like down from the locker rooms to the practice court. And then we got down on the actual court. And I got to go through all of these levels of like restricted access because I was with this guy who like had the key card, who worked there, and who had access to basically the entire building. In an infinitely greater way, in our prayers, when we go to God the Father, who is a holy God, as sinners, we have no business in the presence of a holy God. We see all throughout the Old Testament, we see that like, the holiness, the burning holiness and glory of God is so much that people, like, a bunch of people die when they enter into the presence of this holy God. And people can't even go near to God. And so there's this, like, huge expanse that exists between people who are disobedient and rebellious, like you and me, between a God who is the very opposite of our sin and our rebellion. But when we pray, it's as though we come to this holy God and Jesus comes with us, and Jesus says to his Father, who he has this perfect love relationship with, he says, he's with me. And because you're with Jesus, because you're with the guy that has intimate access with the Father, you too have that intimate access with him. And you too can go directly to the Father and know that every prayer that's made in Jesus' name is a prayer that's made with the same love, with the same affection, with the same acceptance, with the same welcome that God the Father feels for God the Son. You guys, if we understand that, you go back to the illustration of going like, if I live next door to like the Cavs arena and I could go and just like grab my buddy and go play on that court anytime I want, but I neglected that privilege and that opportunity, how stupid would that be? How, how just... Foolish would I be to not take advantage of this immense privilege that I was given. You guys, every time that we get down on our knees to pray, or just any time during the day, you have unlimited direct access to the God who made you, the God of the universe, the all-powerful, all-wise God who created the world that we live in. You can bring Jesus with you. You offer up a prayer in Jesus' name. You say, he's with me, and you have direct access to this God. An incredible privilege. It's unlike anything we can really experience in this life. But I'll tell you guys tonight that, like I said before, if you do not know Jesus, you do not have access to God in this way. I would be doing you guys a huge disservice if I just came up and said like, hey guys, God loves you, believe in yourself, try and pray harder, everything is going to turn out okay. Each of you has a decision to make tonight and at some point in your life, and none of us are promised a moment beyond what we experience in the moment. You have a decision to make of whether or not you want to put your faith in Jesus and have this incredible privilege of direct access to God the Father, to be reconciled and united with the God who you were made for, or to hear this message that I'm sharing with you tonight and reject it and remain outside of Christ and deprive yourself and neglect the privilege 
of direct access to God through Jesus. You got a decision to make. Are you a Christian? Are you just trying to be a Christian? Are you united to Jesus? Are you in Christ? Are you outside of Christ? Are you a branch connected to the vine? Or are you a branch trying to do things on your own outside of Christ? I challenge you guys is to consider this for yourself. It's the most important question you can ever ask yourself. And tonight, if you're in Christ, in small groups, or even when you go home in the quietness of your bedroom or your house or whatever, when you pray, at the end of your prayer, when you say, in Jesus' name I pray, feel the significance of knowing how pleased God is to hear those words and to know that you come in the name of his son. Let's pray. What a privilege it is, God, to be able to say these things, to not just say them, to have, but to have the confidence to know that they're true. God, we have no business speaking to you. We have no business hearing from you. You are a holy and an infinite God that has proven faithful to us, but over and over again, we prove to be rebellious and unfaithful. Yet miraculously, you've made a way that we can actually have a loving, intimate relationship with you through your son, Jesus. He's made a way, he's made a path that we can actually come freely to you as our Father and know that there is not a single prayer that we can pray that is not pleasing to you and that is not accepted by you and beloved by you if it's made in the name of your Son. So I pray in the name of your Son right now, God, that you would take people's hearts in this room and that you would soften them to understand the significance of what we're talking about tonight, that you would cause the people in this room to put their faith in you for the first time maybe, and maybe if it's not for the first time, to be uh, feel that fresh sense of what it means to be united to your son. God, I pray that for myself as well. Help us to understand the privilege that you've given us. Help us not to neglect it. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.